Welcome, Attract Passive Income. Uh, today, we're here with uh, William R. Patterson. Now, let me give you an intro of William. Uh, William R. Patterson is the CEO of the Barron Solution Group, a top 100 minority business enterprise. He was named 2010 Entrepreneur of the Year by African American Lifestyle Magazine and one of the top 20 business icons of 2011 by Exceptional People Magazine. William is ranked one of the top business motivational speakers in the country by Ranking.com. He is a four-time award-winning lecturer and international business, well, international best-selling author who uses his trademark approach called the Baron Solution to coach, train, and to motivate small business owners, executives, sales professionals, and investors. He has shared the stage with billionaires, presidential candidates, a Fortune 100 CEOs. Williams is internationally recognized business and wealth coach who has created over 150 products and has been, featured, been a featured guest on over 500 television and radio programs. He delivers solutions to millions worldwide, from individual investors to small business owners to corporate boards and CEOs. Williams' breakthrough book, The Baron's Son, has been translated all around the world and featured in the Forbes Book Club and Black Enterprise Magazine. William is also an executive producer of the PCOS Challenge, a national award-winning cable television series to help women with a health condition called the PCOS. For more information, we can find uh, Mr. Patterson on www.bearingseries.com. Today, I'd like to welcome William. How are you doing today? I'm doing terrific, Abdul. Thank you. Thank you for man. having me on the show. I appreciate the opportunity. That was a great introduction, man. You you have done a lot. <laughs> I will say. I, I, I have, and uh, hopefully just get, you know. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, first, let's, I, I guess the best place to start here, William, is uh, what is a baron? Explain to all the folks out there. What is a baron? Well, barons have a couple of different definitions. Of course, it's a, a noble title, but... And the way we use it, it's a person who has a great deal of power or influence in a particular industry or niche. And it's a person who's able to take an idea and use that idea to dominate their industry. So that's what we teach. We teach strategies that not only help you survive and, and thrive, but actually dominate. Dominate. I, I like that. Dominate. Okay. Now, um, William, tell us a little about your beginnings. Were, were your mom and <clears throat> Excuse me. Were your mom and dad, were they entrepreneurs? Uh, how did you grow up? You can talk talk yes. about that a little bit. Uh, both my my parents were entrepreneurs. Uh, my mother was more of a social worker. And, and I think that's where I get the humanitarian side of a lot of the things that we do. And my father was an entrepreneur growing up. He had many different businesses. A lot of them were of nature. And I remember growing up as a young kid, there were two experiences that stick out in my mind. The first experience, I was about six years old, and I asked my father for an allowance, and he told me no. He said, one of the things I'm going to show you how to do is to see value in things that other people can't see. So he taught me how to recycle cans, but I didn't do it in a normal way. We just go find a couple of cans. Uh, he taught me how to negotiate with schools to get their cans. This was before they had their national recycling programs. But as a young kid, I had hundreds of dollars a month by recycling these cans and teaching other neighborhood kids to do the same thing. The other thing that really stuck out was an experience my father. I remember him uh, remember later asking him for a pair of shoes. They were a pair of Nikes, they were about two hundred dollars at the time. And he said, "I'm not." He said, "I'm not just going to give you this because I want you to to think about something." You see that beat up pair of shoes you have in the corner over there? And I looked at. He said, "Yeah. How much do you think those shoes are worth?" I said, "Probably next to nothing." He said, "Okay, I want to show you something now." So he he typed on the computer and he picked up. Uh, he pulled up a stock chart for Nike. And over a couple of years, the worth of that stock had doubled. And he said, now tell me, what would you rather have? Would you rather have the pair of shoes or would you rather have the stock? And it was at that point that I realized that with every dollar, I was choosing to be rich or poor. I also understood that I could generate more income and more success by learning to move from being a consumer 
to being an investor, investing in those companies that were making the products and services that I was buying and that my friends were buying, and that I could generate even greater wealth by becoming the business that produced those products and services and sold stock in those businesses to invest. So that's kind of how I got into the investment side of things and the entrepreneurial side. Now, how old were you during, during this conversation, would you think? Uh, this was probably about a, a freshman in high school. I was about a freshman in high school. Okay. Wow, that's a pretty deep conversation. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, it's, but my father, you know, it wasn't always like that. You know, I was a young kid. I didn't know much at, at certain points. Was distracted by a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And it was really my father continuing to plant those seeds. And a lot of times those seeds won't take root until years later. But I remember as a young uh, kid, my father had uh, things like subliminal tapes. Even as a, I used to play basketball. I also used to play uh, baseball and, and I would do swimming. And he had me listen to peak performance tapes, uh, things such as uh, Anthony Robbins, Thinking Real Rich. As a, you know, I didn't appreciate these things as a young kid, but my father would introduce even Laws of Success. You know, a lot of people are familiar with Thinking Grow Rich because it's probably the most famous book, but Law of Success is a thick book that looks like the Bible. Yeah. It comes with a tassel, gold paint, and a lot of people, but that's, that was a, a transformative book for me. For my father to pass that down to me, and again, I didn't appreciate these things until years later, but it was those seeds that helped me understand the importance of expectation, the importance of uh, writing things down. And I remember writing down goals, and I, I, I found a goal sheet uh, probably about 10 years ago that I had written down probably about 20 years ago and just stuck in a book. And I never looked at it again until I found it 10 years later, and I looked in there and I had accomplished everything on that list except for owning a basketball team. I mean, or, or, or excuse me, playing, playing in the NBA. But then I said, uh, well, if I can't play in the NBA because I ended up breaking my hand in high school, I said, it, and I'm also a short guy, by the way. Uh, I said, if I can't play basketball, you know, maybe I'll have a shot at owning the team. So, so that's the next goal. Yeah. <laughs> wow, man, pretty impressive. Now, here, here's a funny one, here, funny question here. Um, you know, we, we're in a so-called recession, and the reason why I say so-called because I think that just because the, the country is having bad financial times doesn't mean that your business has to suffer. And I remember, uh, I'm in a business now, and um, people, maybe like five years after September 11 had happened, they were still blaming their um, unsuccessful business on, you know, September 11. And I was right. just like, no, it can't be. It, it, it just can't be. It, it has to be something more deeper than that why your business isn't actually working. So what would your advice be uh, during these hard economic times uh, for businesses? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I do want people to understand that right now it's kind of like Charles Dickens, a tale of two cities, that it's the best of times for a lot of businesses, but it's also the worst of times for a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Get help from experts. Get help from coaches. Get help from mentors, advisors who can help you understand a lot of these new risks that are converging. And you look at things like high fuel and commodity prices, uh, volatile stock market prices, depressed real estate prices, uh, tight credit market. There are a lot of new risks that are emerging for these different and emerging and converging all at the same time for these different business owners. So it's very difficult for a person who doesn't have that kind of support system to be able to thrive in this environment. Also, one of the major reasons that people struggle, and I call it the, the secret key to wealth, is accountability. Most entrepreneurs have no one to hold them accountable to using the best tools, practices, and strategies. But if you look at Fortune 500 CEOs, Fortune 100 CEOs, they have a board and they have a shareholders that hold them accountable to generating more revenue year over year, quarter over quarter. But when you look at the average small business owner, they don't have anyone that's holding them accountable. The other thing that I would want people to understand is that business is about solving problems, not selling products and services. I'll say that again. Business is about solving problems, not products and services. So what does that mean? Well, in a, a recession or an economic downturn, people have more problems. So it should be easier for you to make money. But if you go out there, you're just trying to sell them stuff that isn't solving a problem, that's not filling an emotional need that they have, you're going to have a much harder time 
generating income. You also have a gold mine in your existing customers. Ask the things that they need more of. What are the things that uh, you can help them do better, faster, and cheaper? So by looking at your existing clients, that's a literal gold mine for you. I, I like you said that business is about solving problems. So basically, a person who opens a business shouldn't definitely be just focused on uh, receiving money. It should be an even exchange. It should think about customer service. It should be think about um, providing a customer a great experience. I mean, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Well, there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities to create income. When I say that business is about solving a problem, you want to understand who you're... Well, okay, well, let, let me back up a little bit. First of all, we need to make sure you have the ideal customer or client in mind. A lot of people struggle because they're trying to sell to the wrong customer segment. They're trying to sell to people that they feel comfortable selling to as opposed to people who have an actual need for the product. And you see this a lot in, let's say, network marketing, direct sales, and I do training for probably about 30, 40 direct sales in network marketing company, where they teach you a six-foot rule or a 10-foot rule, approach everyone within six to 10 feet of you about the business. Well, everyone within six to 10 feet of you is not an ideal prospect or customer for the business. So the first thing you want to do is choose people who have a need and who can afford to pay you. Those are the two uh, criteria right there. That, that's the and the way you find that sweet spot is by answering the question, what problem am I solving? So you want to identify who are your ideal customers, the people who have a need for your product or service and can afford to pay you. And then you want to say, what are the top three to five problems that I can help them solve, ideally through a unique or proprietary system? Okay. Now, when you do that, your next step after you say, what are the problems I can solve through a unique or proprietary system, you want to do a better and a clearer job of explaining your products and services than your competitors. So even if it's not a unique idea, you can still compete and make a lot of sales if you do a better and a clearer job of explaining the rational and emotional benefits of your product or service. And I'm, Abdul, I'm sure you've been on the internet and tried to buy something and you couldn't even figure out what the product was supposed to do because they had such a poor description. There was no video. There was no testimonials. People just slap a product and expect it to sell, but it, it doesn't work that way. You have to create value and you have to explain the benefits. Wow, okay, That's, I, I like your answer. Uh, now, when a person is trying to this, because a lot of people get stuck here, uh, should they do something they're passionate in or should they try to find something that is, or they, should they try to, to fulfill a need? You know, maybe something is missing in a town that isn't going on. What, what's your take on that? Well, I think there are a couple of options, and we typically say for people, if you've ever done anything successfully in your life and you're also passionate about it, you can turn that into a business. You can turn it into a system, a repeatable system, and that's the important part, and that's the differentiating factor, at least one of the different factors between being self-employed and actually owning a business that you can automate or sell, that you have some repeatable processes that people can follow, whether these are interns, volunteers, independent contractors, or even employees. So that's one of the first things is look at what have you done successfully that you can uh, put into a system that other people can follow. Now, if you're a person that's never done anything successfully, you're, you're not passionate, you're in luck too because you can also turn your problems into a successful business. Now, um, I always you know, typically tell people that if you're that person who's not passionate about anything, you probably have a lot of problems. So, you know, that, that's, that's an area to focus on. Now, the beautiful thing about building a business based on problem solving is that you do not have to be the expert that solves the problem. You can be the facilitator that connects the audience who has the problem. And usually, if you have that problem, there are thousands, if not millions of other people who also have that problem. You can connect that audience with the experts who are uh, solve that problem. You can get paid either by building up an audience similar to this show you can build up an audience and pull in advertisers and sponsors. Uh, I call it the Oprah Winfrey model, where Oprah doesn't claim to be an expert on a particular topic, but you know she would bring in all these different experts, uh, Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, to solve the, the problems of her audience. And Oprah got the credit. So you can do it under your brand and, and, your, and your system and bring all of these other experts to solve those problems. So those are two great ways, your passion and your problems. Wow. That, that's a pretty, I like, you You call it the Oprah effect? Is that what you said? Uh, the, oh, the Oprah Winfrey model. The Oprah, Oprah Winfrey model, yeah. Okay, here's another problem people have. People are saying, look, um, I don't have $100,000 to start a business. I don't have money. Uh, the banks won't give me a loan. 
you know, uh, what would you say to a person that is looking to start a business and feel that they don't have enough money to start? Great question. Well, I always tell people it may take money to make money, but it doesn't take your money to make money. Okay. So there are a lot of great uh, ways to fund businesses out there. You have uh, trade lines of credit. You also have uh, business loans. You have private investment. You have corporate sponsorship. You have uh, grants, both foundation grants and government grants. And you also have strategic partnerships. So a lot of times you may not need the money, but you may need what the money can get. Now, I'd always say that any situation of lack, be it customers, credit, credibility, or cash, can be solved through a partnership. You just have to figure out the value and the benefit that you bring to that partnership or that relationship. So, uh, for instance, there was a young lady who started our coaching program who used to be an associate in The Gap okay, and the clothing store. Yeah. And she said, you know, I know some millionaires, but I don't think they would want to help me. And I said, OK, well, what we'll do is we'll help you raise your value. So we helped her start a radio show, a television show. Now she can go to those people and say, I'd like to promote your business to 100,000 people. You know, she's creating value. She's raised her value. So now it's easier for people to want to help them. So that's one thing is to look for ways in which you can can raise your value. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that. You can support someone's favorite cause of charity. You can create a PR opportunity for them. You can create an income opportunity. You can connect them with other influential people in your network. But build those relationships. And just as important as any financial plan in your business is a networking plan. And this is one of the things that a lot of of uh, entrepreneurs fail to do is to have a networking plan every year and say, these are the top 10 people that I want to meet this year or people in these positions or at these companies and to go about building those relationships so that you can get the help and compensate for the money. But uh, that's one of the things that we do as coaches is we help people connect with the right funding sources at the right time. Because uh, I'm sure you may have seen from, uh, let's say, uh, shows like Shark Tank if you've ever seen that show. I love that show. Yeah. Right. Where people come in there and what's one of the first questions the, the sharks ask? Well, what, do you, what have you done in sales? So if you're going to a person before you, you've implemented your business, and we typically say, take your business and implement it on a small scale. Take your, your idea and show that it can work. Generate some sales. And then you go get experience management. People who have 15, you know, 10, 15, 20 years experience in that business, get them to sign a letter of intent that says, once we get funding, I'd like to bring you on as uh, one of the, the chief, uh, chief officers in the company, or the chief executive, chief operating, chief financial, or any other management capacity once we get the funding. So you get them to give you a soft commitment with something called a letter of intent. And then you go to your investors and say, we generated this much in sales, plus we have these top uh, people coming on board once we get the funding. And then you use your investors and you also use your uh, your management team to help you form those strategic partnerships, which can open up distribution, open up new marketing. So that's a model that requires very little capital up front is to prove it on a small scale. And you can't bring in you know, one small partner if you need to, to put up some initial capital to get that going and then get letters of intent from experience management, then go to your investors and then have them both help you form strategic partnership. So basically when, uh, one of the main reasons probably why a lot of businesses fail is because they don't have the right expertise around them in order to succeed. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the, the big reasons. The number one reason that we say is that lack of accountability and that structure. There was a study that came out from the American Society of Training and Development that said the probability of you achieving a goal if you hear an idea is 10%. If you plan how you're going to achieve it, it jumps to 50%. But if you have someone who can help you plan and hold you accountable, it jumps to 95%. So you can nearly double your chances of success by having that team and that coach and advisor. And there is a difference between coaches, advisors, and mentors, too. So it is important for people to understand those differences. You may have advisors who have a specific set of knowledge. They may be tax accountants. They may be uh, asset protection folks. They may be estate planners. And they have... Uh, a, a very particular set of skills that you're going to need, but they may not understand the ramifications in those other areas. So your tax account may not understand the consequences on your asset protection of a certain decision. So that's why you do want a coach who can help you put those types of different players uh, together for you. But the other thing about uh, is you have mentors. And a lot of people confuse mentors with the need of a coach. A mentor 
may uh, have achieved success. And mentors are important. So these are all important people to have on your team, but you need to understand the difference in when they use them. But a mentor may have achieved success in your industry. But the problem is your mentor went to Harvard. Your mentor started with $10 million. Your mentor doesn't necessarily have a repeatable process for moving you from where you are to where you want to be based on all of the things in your current situation. So they bring a certain degree of knowledge, they bring a certain degree of experience and relationships, but they don't necessarily bring an A to Z process. And that's where a coach comes in, is a coach gives you the A to Z process. They say, hey, Abdul, you want to get to uh, LA from New York? Okay, well, uh, here's your, your GPS, here's your, your, your keys to the rental car, mm -hmm. uh, here are your plane tickets. Once you get off the plane, there's going to be someone holding 